Good morning, guys. Greetings in the name of Jesus Christ. How are you all doing? So something happened this morning, and it, it spurred and inspired our subject for this morning. You guys know if you've uh, watched yesterday's video, you know that I was at a celebration live service for a close friend. And I met a lot of people there that I used to go to my last church with. And I love them all. Wonderful people. Uh, I had no real issues with anybody. Uh, but there was things, you know, every church has problems and there's issues and there's groups and there's people that like to do certain things. People that like to play little silly games that I don't have time for. Um, and some of those people are the reason why I no longer go to that church and why I don't really, you know, focus on staying in, in touch with everybody there. Because a, a lot of things were said behind the scenes. Anyway, without getting into a long, big ordeal about it, I was asked this morning in a text, I didn't hardly sleep last night, and I wake up and there's this text message, a couple hours old, and um, asking if I was going, and I said no. Hadn't made any specific plans to. And through the process of conversation, realized or found out that evidently, Somehow, some people came up with this idea that there was going to be a big reunion of all the old members at that church today. And I told this individual that called me, um, I don't know where anybody got that from because I never said that. I made a passing comment at saying I might make it if I'm feeling good enough. But I wake up every day and never know how I'm going to feel. This morning I'm coughing my head off and <coughs> having a hard time walking. But that, you guys understand, people make stuff up. And what they end up doing is they end up causing issues. Because then you have people that are like, well, wait, that never happened. Well, I identified several of the individuals in that particular church that, did, that do this kind of stuff. <laughs> Whoever started this, I have no clue. Whoever instigated, I have no clue. I have a pretty good idea because... They're the ones that initiated the contact. But I made it clear that, that that was not what was said. This happens in every single building that calls that, that has a title of church. There are cliques and groups that do this stuff. They make up things about other people. I witnessed that in that church. They uh, will say this was said when it wasn't. They will use it as a as a tool to keep people under thumb, to exercise authority over individuals. I mean, it, you just, it runs the gamut of, of reasons why people do certain things like this. In most cases, they, they do it to distract attention from themselves and to put it off on others. This is a narcissistic behavior. One of the reasons why a lot of really, actually really good people don't go to, back to that church after a while is because of these things. And they wonder why it happens. They wonder why people don't go. And that's why. The Bible has a very clear instructions concerning people that do these things. I'm waiting for someone else to contact me. I figure later today I'm probably going to get contacted again. And it's going to tell me what I, what I already know is going on. But it will help me confirm. <laughs> When that kind of stuff rears its head, you've got to deal with it right up front. You have to be right up front. And I used to let people use that to guilt me into things. I don't anymore. In fact, now that's a warning sign to me to, to stay even further away and not get involved in things. Because if that's going on, then there's no telling what else has been said. I got a phone call from that same individual earlier in the year talking about my brother dying. My brother's not dead. Who told you that? So... You see how it can escalate into weird areas. So let's cover a couple of scriptures. Proverbs 16, 20. And, that, and there's no real easy way to deal with this either. And I know most of you guys have dealt with this in churches that you've gone to. There's no real easy way to deal with this except to confront it head on. Proverbs 16, 20. A dishonest man spreads strife and a whisper separates close friends. 
when we talk about someone else, when we arbitrarily judge someone else, oh, I can't believe how that person, you know, they, they, they were doing that, most of them in there were doing that to me when I was helping that, uh, my, that my friend Carol, whenever she had passed away, uh, help take care of her horse ranch. And things were actually said in the morning message, which was really disturbing to me that the pastor would do that. But they were directed at me. And I made a point later to make sure multiple people knew. You know, the reason why is because a friend of mine that I've known for a long, long time has died of cancer and I'm taking care of her 20 acre horse ranch. And it's almost two hour drive away. What I've learned is you have to be upfront when people do this. You have to be upfront and direct because if that stuff is allowed to happen, it they will do everything they can to, it's narcissism, to bring negativity onto you. It's happening in my own family. That's why I don't talk to multiple members of my family because the same thing's happening there. And, and I'm not interested in being a part of it anymore because of the, the, the level of negativity that it's brought and almost costing my marriage multiple times. In fact, for several of these individuals in my family, that was the goal. But thank God it didn't work. But you, you just, you, after a while, you get fed up with it. The Bible very clearly says don't get involved in this stuff. Proverbs twenty nineteen: whoever goes about slandering reveals secrets. Therefore, do not associate with a simple babbler. You know who those people are. Going over there, just talking, talking, talking. This one individual that I talked to this morning used to put this prayer request up every morning, every Sunday morning. And I knew it was about me, specifically. But they didn't have the guts or the courage to come out and speak openly. But they were more than happy to talk behind the scenes. Because what they don't know is some of the people they talked to came back and told me what they said. Now, I didn't address it with that individual in person. That, that was the wife of the elder of the church. But I did bring it up to the pastor and tell him, if you want me to continue coming here and doing these things for you, I would really appreciate if you could squash this. This is a problem. My wife won't set foot on the property anymore because of it. Because there were some things that happened that I, I wasn't aware of concerning her. Things that were said. So, what do you, you know, how, how do you properly address it? You've got to address it up front and be honest. And if the situation is where, and this is usually what happens in my experience, mo the bulk of the people will choose that side over yours. Uh, you have to walk away. And that's why I walked away. And I made that very clear. <laughs> and evidently it, didn't, it fell on deaf ears. I don't know. But it, it is frustrating because this is one of the biggest corruptors of the church is this gossip, this judging, this telling stories about things that aren't true, things that never happened. And I've had to do, I've had to do this several times. People would tell me this. I never said that. Who, who told you that? That never happened. So a, a lot of talk goes on behind the scenes. And, and I'm making a practice to never say anything in private that I won't say to that person's face. Or make sure that I've said it to their face before I speak about it in private. Because I don't, I'm not going to hide anything. I'm honest to a fault. And it makes people mad. But m men, most people respect me because I do that. Because I don't keep anything to myself. I don't keep secrets. They don't tell me secrets. I, don't, I have a lot of secrets from years ago that I'll take to my grave. But I don't do that anymore. And when they tell me, hey, don't tell nobody this. Whoop, that, you better not tell me then. I don't want to know it. I don't want that stress and that guilt hanging over me all the time. And people love to do that stuff. If you've got a problem with someone else, you need to go deal with them, not me. And I've had to do this because of the stress. Ephesians 4.29, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. We're to avoid, in Christ, avoid talking that separates. Avoid talking that causes problems. And I witnessed a lot of that stuff going on. In, in every church that I've been, I've been to a couple of churches, I've witnessed that stuff happen constantly. And it's like people don't even care. They don't even realize where they are. They don't regard Christ and his word because they don't know his word. Or it applies to thee, not to me, is the, is the mentality. 
Proverbs eleven thirteen. Whoever goes about slandering reveals secrets, but he who is trustworthy in spirit keeps something covered. Just like I told you, people have told me stuff, and if they say don't say nothing, I, I okay, and I don't ever say nothing. It stays there, and people will ask me. It's funny because other people will call, will contact me and ask me about it. Well, that's not something I'm um it's I'm allowed to share. It's not right for me to share that information. You need to contact that individual, and I've had several people do that to me recently concerning my friend that just passed away. I said, that's not my place to, to, to talk about those things. You need to contact the individual in person. But see, I don't like it when people go around and ask other people about that kind of stuff. To me, that's shady. Go to the individual and talk to the individual. Well, maybe there's a reason why they, they can't go to the individual. So, it's frustrating. And now, it this doesn't just happen in church. This was happening in the grace community, which is another one of the big reasons, probably probably the top three biggest reasons why I broke from the grace community and, and don't associate with all, I think I only associate with one or two of them. I, I don't want anything to deal with it because that stuff's nonsense. There's no place in the church. There's no place in Christianity. Integrity is key and paramount in all of these things. And it is one of the things the Bible teaches us integrity. If you can't have integrity, what good are you to the Lord? Doesn't the Bible say no liar will have part in the kingdom of heaven? No inheritance. I, can, I, can, I can't even imagine dedicating your entire life to the Lord and thinking that you're good to go and then all of a sudden you get there and you realize yeah, but you don't have an inheritance because you're a liar. Wait, what? See, I know I'm a liar and I confess that. And I ask him to make sure that I don't do that anymore. And when I do, to correct me. But there's some people that think they're, there's nothing wrong with what they do. That's where these problems come in. Proverbs, oh no, wait. Uh, yeah, Proverbs 26, 20. For lack of wood, the fire goes out. And where there is no whisperer, quarreling ceases. I learned this a long time ago. If you, if you identify somebody that does these things, whether it's at a job, at church, wherever it is, don't give them any fuel. Refuse to talk. Refuse to give them details. Then they have nothing to, to, to gossip about. Some people, that they live for these, these things. They live for this stuff. <laughs> Leviticus 19.16, you shall not go around as a slander among your people, and you shall not stand up against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. Let me read that again. Leviticus 19.16, you shall not go around as a slanderer among your people. What were the Jews doing at the time Jesus was getting his ministry kicked off? When his time had come, they were doing exactly that. And you shall not stand up against the life of your neighbor. They were doing the same thing then too. He specifically said in the law not to do that, and yet they did it. We have that in everyday life today. In fact, it's one of the biggest parts of society. Look at these people that are, they call, call themselves First Amendment auditors, and they run around with cameras harassing police and people in post offices and stuff. It has nothing to do with First Amendment. They're, they're, they want to slander people and pick on people, and that's how they do it. They bully people. It's an excuse. And we're not supposed to be doing those things. Proverbs 18, 8. The words of a whisperer are like delicious morsels. They go down into the inner parts of the body. And they also corrupt and cause all kinds of problems. First Timothy five thirteen. Besides that, they learn to be idlers, going about from house to house, and not only idlers, but also gossips and busybodies, saying what they should not. See, there are things sometimes that we see that we shouldn't talk about. There are things that we hear that we shouldn't repeat. If you don't want to be caught up in this stuff, you've got to separate yourself from it. That's one of the reasons why I quit going to my last church. I saw how much I was getting drug into it. I was a, I was a fixture in that church for a couple of years. I saw how much I was getting drug into it. I saw how many issues it was causing. This isn't worth it. I would rather leave and have the sanctity of the church stay stay the way it is than to be there and have the issues escalate. 
And when, and when it happened, I actually got calls from the pastor. Who told, who told you that? Well, it doesn't matter. Well, yeah, it does matter because somebody's saying things about me that aren't true. You wonder why people leave your church? Well, that's why. You've got people in that in the church you, you need to identify and get rid of. See, that's why the pastor's supposed to keep his congregation clean. You're supposed to purge the congregation. You're supposed to run people off that do that stuff. You tell them. The Bible says this. Put them out of the church. If they won't listen, put them out. 2 Corinthians 12, 20. For I fear that perhaps when I come, I may find you not as I wish, and that you may find me not as you wish, that perhaps there may be quarreling, jealousy, anger, hostility, slander, gossip, conceit, and disorder. This was a big problem in the early church. No surprise, it's, it's still a big problem. Psalm 34, 13. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. James 1, 26. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Proverbs 10, 18. The one who conceals hatred has lying lips. And whoever utters slander is a fool. Exodus 23, 1. You shall not spread a false report. You shall not join hands with the wicked man to be a malicious witness. What does the Bible say in the New Testament? You find somebody that does those things, you don't even greet such a one. Because to do so is to partake in their sin. And people got mad at me and wondered why I did what I did when I identified all these people doing this stuff. The Bible told us, tells us to do this. We're supposed to do these things. James 4.11, do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. This is New Testament. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. Who made you judge? No one. God is the judge. Jesus Christ is the judge. But we presume to think because we have attained a high position in our self-righteousness that we think we are able to speak against another. You know who is the least to speak against anyone? The pastor of the church. And what do we see happening? The pastor's doing the most. If you look at a, at a, at a shepherd, <coughs> he's got his flock of sheep. And when two sheep start getting after it, he, goes, he carries a staff for a reason. He goes in there, gives them a little pop, Breaks it up. Hey, stop it. I don't need y'all bruised up. There's a lot of money invested in those animals. But he breaks up that stuff. He doesn't instigate them. He leads them and presents them with the grass to eat. They eat the grass. He leads them to shelter for safety. He takes them where they need to go to the water to get drinks. And when problems come, he gets in between them and the problems. He protects the flock. He does not oversee or judge the flock. That's not what the pastor is called to do. Yet that's what we see pastors doing. And that's where a lot of this stuff comes from. Idle talk. You got a person in your congregation that smells particularly bad? Okay, well, instead of judging them, oh man, they must not never take a shower. Instead, why don't you go find out there because there's health conditions that do that there's medications i take medications that do that to me you got a person that's driving a beat up old car don't judge them help them with the situation There's a lot of problems with what we believe because we don't take God's word into account. When we don't take God's word into account, we stumble. It's unfortunate. It's very unfortunate. Psalm 101.5 Whoever slanders his neighbor secretly, I will destroy. Whoever has a haughty look and an arrogant heart, I will not endure. Let me read that again. This is the Lord speaking. Whoever slanders his neighbor secretly, I will destroy. Whoever has a haughty look and an arrogant heart, I will not endure. Doesn't God resist the proud? Yeah. Romans one twenty nine. They were filled with all manner of unrighteous evil, a righteousness and evil and covetousness, malice. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. 
They are gossips. You see what just one little, tiny little thing, what kind of problem it causes, how much of an issue it creates. Unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice, envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. We're going to end with Proverbs 6, 16 through 19. There are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him. Note this list. Haughty eyes, that's a high look, high mindedness. A lying tongue. Now lying isn't just your car is red. No, my car is blue. That's 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 not what he's talking about. It's much much deeper and much worse than that. And hands that shed innocent blood, not in killing, not just in, in taking a life, but shed innocent blood in trying to beat down or break down another person spiritually. That's also what that refers to. A heart that devises wicked plans. Well, I'm going to say this and get that person in trouble. Or I'm going to do that and get that person in trouble. I'm going to go have a talk with this person and get them to go deal with this. Because I don't like this. A heart that devises wicked plans. Feet that make haste to run to evil. You ever see when the group breaks on Fellowship Sunday and, and all the, 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 the click all bloop, and they ball up. And, they, and you see them like little chickens, little hens go with their cackling. Yep. That's, that's what that's talking about. A false witness who breathes out lies and one who sows discord among the brothers. God hates, and they are an abomination, people who breathe out lies, a false witness, and people who sow discord among the brothers. And we have Christians that are the worst about this. They are the worst about this. And they wonder why people get mad. It's misdirection. Oh, I didn't say that. But you're the one that contacted me about it. Who else would have? See what I mean? They put themselves in the spotlight in their attempts to do damage control, in their attempts to, to straighten the situation out. God hates these things. They're an abomination to him. He abhors them. He wants nothing to do with them. And he certainly doesn't want that in his kingdom. That's why I've sh I share you guys all these scriptures that talk about all these people that are saved but have no inheritance in the kingdom. And you go to Revelation chapter 22 and you read, here's the holy city. It's got its gates. It's all what it's built of. All the people of God enter there and there. But without are, what does it say? Let's see. Now right here, verse 14. Verse 14 and verse 15. Revelation 22, verse 14. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. Now this is Revelation chapter 22. This is after the white throne judgment. Verse 15, but outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. If everybody was judged and sent to the lake of fire, who are these people here that are standing outside the city on the new earth? This is the new earth here. Who are these people? These are the ones who were saved because they believed but did not inherit the kingdom. I have yet to find anybody. I have yet to find anybody to clarify why the Bible lists these people standing outside the city that are not allowed in. They have no inheritance in there. They don't have access to the tree of life. They don't have access to the river of life. There's other scriptures that talk about that. We can't get into that today. Otherwise, it'll take this video will be hours long. But it goes pretty in-depth into this if you do a study on it. Who are these people? We just talked about them. Proverbs 6, 16 through 19. These are six things the Lord hates. Seven are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil, a false witness who breathes out lies, and one who sows discord among the brothers. The exact same list you just read in Revelation 22, 14.
or 15. But they think everything's fine. I believe it's fine. But you could lose your inheritance. See, see, people don't talk about this. They don't address this. That's why I address it. Because I can't find anybody that addresses it. We are specifically told not to do this. And in Proverbs, it specifically tells us this is an abomination to God. And what do we see happening? So what do you do in these situations? You've got to nip it in the bud right away. You have to let everybody know that you're not that kind of person. And you're not going to put up with that kind of stuff. No matter who, if you're first day in a church, no, no, no. If it comes up, you've got to right away address it. And if there, you get any backlash, I'm glad you let your, you let me know who you stand with and who you are. And you walk out and you don't go back because it, it just causes more and more and more problems. I was planning on, if I had to sleep last night, going, going to my old church this morning. Go see some of the people I care about and love. But after that, I don't think I want to. Because I already know, I already know where it's going to go. It's just... The, the, the strong feeling is, I need to avoid this situation. There's, there's danger. You have to be careful for these things, guys. You have to watch out for these things because these are the things that are bringing down the, the true church. These are the, the, this is the reason why you have so many people. And, and they tell you all the time, go, go to a church, fellowship with others. Well, how can I? I can't fellowship with anybody because there's too many roadblocks in the way. And I've told people on here that they have churches, but they have an online church. I've told them, how can I go to a church when I can't find one that has so, all these roadblocks? As soon as I walk in the door, immediately I'm being judged. If I had a church, and I just spent a bunch of money putting new seats and all that stuff in there, and somebody come in soaking wet and covered in mud because they just helped somebody in a ditch, you come sit up front with me. You get the honored spot. You did something good on the way in. You know what I got when I did it? Backseat. Very backseat. And I had to give an explanation as to why I was muddy. Could have gone back home and come back late. No. I come before the Lord however I am. I came into this world screaming and covered in blood. I'm probably going to go out that way. But the Lord won't look on me any differently either way. Because if I walk in integrity, it doesn't matter. If I have faith in him, it doesn't matter. If I look to him and trust him and believe in him, it doesn't matter. Yet yeah, what do we see happen today? We're a blue jeans and boots shirt uh, type of church. Really? Well, why, did, why did people look down on me when I came in in blue jeans and boots? wonder why people don't go to church. That's why. We wonder why people go to YouTube ministers. That's why. People are tired of it. They're fed up with it. See, the true church isn't sitting in a building. The true church are those who have faith in Jesus Christ and who accept each other. No judgment, no misconceptions, no preconceived ideas. I don't care who you are, how old you are, what you look like, what you have going on. It matters not. What I look at in, in an individual person, whoever I'm talking to here online, is integrity. Do you have integrity? And I found a lot of people out to not have integrity in the almost three years I've been doing this. What you get from me is all of me. Right up front and honest. No, no beating around the bush. No, no holding back. But you know what you get from most people? They tell you what they think you want to hear. I've had it happen. 
or they attack you. And they wonder why so many people don't want to go to church. Why so many people don't want to get in a group. It's not safe there. But you know what? Jesus Christ knows who's his. He knows who you are. He, he's identified you. You're marked to be a part of his church. You're marked to be part of the bride. He knows what you're struggling with. He knows what you're going through. He knows your concerns. I've touched on a lot of things that hit a lot of people to the core. He knows. He's aware. He sees it all. And it's going to be dealt with. You keep walking in faith and trust. You keep believing. You keep going back to his word and trusting his word. You do that and you'll never, ever, ever have a problem. And when you find stuff like that, when you th see things going on, Proverbs 6, 9, 16 through 19, Revelation chapter 22, when you identify those people, don't let them do that to you. Deal with it right away and then get out of the situation. Because if you stay there, like, like Proverbs also says, bad company ruins good morals. If you stay there, it's just going to get worse. And it can cause you to slip into sin. Be careful. Watch over yourselves. Go to God's word for all these things. Don't be afraid to speak up and tell people the truth. You're, they're not going to like it. I can tell you that right now from personal experience. They're not going to like it. They're going to hate it. And they're going to hate you for saying it. But what did Jesus say? Blessed are, is he who is attacked and treat, mistreated for the name of Christ. Blessed is he who is judged for the name of Christ. Blessed is he who people gossip about because of the name of Christ. Because they won't talk about each other, but they'll sure talk about you if you're faithful. That's how Satan works. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning in the name of Jesus Christ to give you praise, honor, and glory. To lift you up and sing praises unto your holy name. And Father, I want to give thanks this morning for your word that tells us the truth about ourselves. It starts home first. You tell us the truth about ourselves so that we can identify these things and turn from them, repent, change our mind, and become better, grow in sanctification. And in the process of doing that, we learn to identify these things, and then we are able to start seeing them with others. Now, you tell them, even though we see those things, not to judge those people. And so we do our best not to do so. But Father, what do we do when they do that to us? And we identify that they're trying to draw us into their vicious circle and circumstances you tell us avoid them get away from them don't have anything to do with them break contact with them you tell us not to associate with people like this because as proverbs 6 says these things are an abomination to you you hate these things and this is the most prominent thing we see in the quote-unquote church today father what do we do how do we get out of this we fellowship with you. We read your word. We look inward and we identify ourselves and where we're walking. And you will take care of those and how they're walking. But Father, I do know that you don't expect us to put up with those things. You say, address it. If they won't listen, you take two and all three of you address it. Then you go to the church and let the church address it. And if nothing happens, you put them out. Be done with them. Because they have to come to you and they have to come to, into repentance and correct these things. And get themselves back on the path. And they have to do it between you and them. And it doesn't involve the rest of us. We all have to walk that walk. Father, I thank you that you open our eyes up to what we do and our hypocrisy. Because when we change, it makes it easier for us to identify others that are doing that. So we don't get caught in that turmoil and that gossip and those problems. And it, and it hurts that we have to break away from people, that we have to break fellowship, but you tell us to do this. Not to deal with these things, because bad company ruins good morals. You can, we can get drugged down into their personal hell. Misery loves company. That, that cannot be a truer saying. Misery doesn't want to be by itself. It wants others with it. Father, make us to, to see Make us to see where we stand. Make us to see what we're doing. Make us to, to see how we're addressing these things. 
so that when we are faced with it from another, we know what to do, the right way to handle it, and whether or not we need to remove ourselves from it. And that we do it with as much love as we can, but, but directly, not indirectly. It's dangerous living right now. It's dangerous to be a Christian right now. It's so hard to do the right thing all the time because we're bombarded on every side from every angle. But Father, I thank you that you've given us open eyes and an open heart and that you've put your qualities in us. Make us to love them anyway, but make us to be bold and brave that we'll stand up for your truth regardless of what they say or do. That way you are glorified always. And I pray that people, the people that are doing this, I pray that they'll come to repentance, that they'll realize what they're doing and turn away from it and turn to you instead. And stop doing these things because it's ripping the church apart. Father, thank you for your mercy and grace. Thank you for your great love. Thank you for your salvation. Thank you that even though these people do these things and they believe they're saved, but it bothers me that so many are, are probably possibly or probably who knows i don't know what's going on with them i'm not the judge but it, it's disheartening and discouraging that so many may lose their inheritance because they engage in these things father make it not to be so make, make us to not do this make us to honor your word and to honor you in all that we do so that we receive a full reward so that we stand in grace and in perfection and not with our heads held in shame. So that we have the right to access the city and to access the tree of life and the river of life and we're not outside, not able to go in. Father, make us to change. And then by example, help others to change too. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen. Thank you guys for joining me for morning prayer. This is a touchy subject. It's a hard subject, too, because so many people have had some experience with this. There's a lot of people that have been partakers of this and have come out of it. There's a lot of people that are still in it. Excuse me. <clears throat> There's a lot of people that don't know what to do. They want to go to church. They love the fellowship. But every time they go, it's problem after problem after problem. What do we do? We've got, we've got to squash it. And if the, the leaders won't do anything about it, then, then we have to walk away and find another one. But the one thing, the one solace you have is that if you can't find a congregation to fellowship with, if you can't find a group of people you can trust and feel comfortable around, you always have the Lord to fellowship with every Sunday, just like we're doing now. You can find one other person what did Jesus say? Where two or more are gathered in my name, I will be there. It only takes two people to make a church. And you can do it in the front seat of a car. You can do it in a parking lot. You can do it under a tree, by a pond, by a lake, anywhere. Anywhere where two or more are gathered in his name, he's there. That's church. So it doesn't have to be a big congregation. All these guys, they're telling people, go find a church because they want tithing. They want money. Because they got all these bills and responsibilities. They've overcomplicated the truth in the gospel. It's not required. You find another person that you trust. And that's who you fellowship with. And you two together in the name of Jesus Christ make a church. It doesn't require a big group of people. Some of the best. And Chuck Missler made this statement. Several other people have. And all these guys with big churches. That they realized the greatest evangelicalism, the greatest learning and teaching happens in a church with no pastor. It happens in the home church where people meet in living rooms and have church instead. He said, that's where the great change happens. That's where the growth happens. He said, he said this is what Chuck Mister said. He said, that's the church, not the building. That's the church. Buildings are great. Buildings are fine. But that's not the church. The church are the people. A building is irrelevant. So if you're struggling with this, you have a, a recourse. Find a person you trust. Get together with them. 
and you too, together with the Lord, make church. It's that easy. I love you guys. I bless you all in Jesus' name. I'll see you in the next video.